So good evening, doctors. Uh, I Shumon on behalf of uh, Shield Healthcare, welcoming you all in uh, today's webinar. And the topic of the today's webinar is uh, menopause and uh, non-hormonal treatment. And our guest speaker is uh, Dr. Gyanaranjan Patnaik, sir. So before moving into the webinar, let's have a look on our Shield Connect page. Uh, this is our Shield Connect page. It's a basically a knowledge sharing platform. And here you can find different blogs uh, written by many eminent doctors across India. And uh, these are the past webinars already we have conducted in our platform in uh, many topics as well. And here you can find the PCOS awareness blog. Uh, uh, this contains uh, all the lectures related to the PCOS in different regional languages as well. You can find uh, here. And uh, this is the most important in times of uh, COVID era time. And uh, this is the COVID-19 and coronavirus awareness blogs. Here you can find different blogs related to coronavirus. And the most important thing is our uh, key opinion leaders. So almost 250 to 300 doctors are currently supporting us this knowledge sharing platform of uh, SHIELD. And I request all the participants please have a look on this website as it is very uh, informative one. And uh, now let's start our uh, webinar. As I mentioned already, uh, the topic is uh, menopause and uh, non-hormonal treatment. And uh, our guest speaker is uh, Dr. Gyanaranjan Patnaksan. And it's my honor to introduce sir. Sir is the consultant uh, gynecologist uh, in Marste Hospital, Jamshedpur, and special interest in uh, gynecology endoscopy and uh, infertility. So with this short introduction, uh, I request sir to take over the session. And meanwhile, I request all the participants to post your queries on the QA dashboard on the Shield Connect page. So once the webinar will be over, so we shall have a short discussion on this topic with sir. So thank you, sir, and uh, over to you, sir. Uh, Suman sir, I think uh, sir uh, left the meeting. I just called him. He will join in another one or two minutes. Uh, sir, uh, Patnaik, sir? Yeah. Yeah, okay. you can share screen sorry. now. Sir. No yeah, problem. Yeah. Sorry, sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, now I think, yeah. shall, I, shall we start? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can start. Hello? Yes, yes sir. You can start, sir. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good evening all. Uh, 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 today, we are going to discuss uh, something about non-hormonal treatment for menopause. Uh, thank you, Shield, for giving me this opportunity to speak on this important topic. So here are my presentation. So menopause, as we all know, is defined as amenorrhea more than 12 months following final menstrual period and if it is before 35 we call it as a premature menopause so what are the terminology we use for describing different stages of reproductive life in a woman we normally follow straw staging system which is uh, uh, as we all know there are three stages in reproductive life for a woman one is reproductive menopausal transition and postmenopause so uh, uh, again, those three stages were divided into uh, early and late into seven stages, which is uh, in reproductive phase, we have uh, three stages and we 
give a number as a minus five, minus four, and minus three. Uh, till zero is the final phase, uh, final uh, menopause, men menstrual period, FMP. So the changes which happen during these stages are in uh, first of all in reproductive part, early reproductive part, peak of reproductive age and late reproductive age. And in early and uh, reproductive age, the menstrual cycle will be variable to regular. Whereas uh, in uh, peak and late uh, reproductive uh, age, uh, the menstrual cycle will be regular. And uh, if you see the menopausal transition period, which is perimenopause, we say, the early perimenopause, there will be a cycle uh, variability more than seven days, which is different from the women uh, regular cycles before. And we call it as a late perimenopause if it, she has skipped more than two, uh, sorry, two skip cycles or interval of more than 60 days. And after that phase, there will be amenorrhea for 12 months before we speak as a, we call it as a postmenopause. And then also postmenopause, there will be early postmenopause, which includes this uh, one year of amenorrhea and postmenopause, late postmenopause, which is usually two to three years after. And the endocrine variability, which we see uh, till early and peak reproductive period, the FSH level will be normal. And after that, it just starts rising till postmenopause. Uh, so, what are the hormone levels at menopause? If we uh, uh, go through it, there will be definitely circulating the estrogen reduction. There is reduced ratio of estrogen to androgen because of less estrogen. Uh, also, there is reduction in sexual hormone binding globulin, SHBG. There'll be increased peripheral aromatization of BHEA to a strong, which uh, leads to, uh, because of that, there'll be a uh, estrogen label in the peripheral blood even after menopause. And, but there is no significant change in testosterone level because uh, uh, menopause pairs stroma of the ovary. And if we see the follicular loss, we all know menopause is because of the depletion of follicles. So if you see the follicular loss at the birth, it's around 60 to 70 lakhs, which gets uh, reduced every year by year till it becomes zero at the point of 55 to 60 years, where we say it's a complete menopause. And in the peak of reproductive period, there are only uh, 1,000 to 10,000 follicles. So what are the menopausal symptoms? So menopause is the final menstrual period and the menopause or menopausal transition is the time of onset between the change, menstrual changes until one year after the final menstrual period. And the changes in vaginal breathing and patterns of vasomotor symptoms characterize the transition, but the overall experience is highly variable from uh, uh, different uh, uh, ladies and uh, it may be influenced by psychological, social, and cultural factors. Uh, common symptoms include heart flushes, night sweats, vasomotor symptoms, these are, and genital symptoms, particularly uh, because of urogenital atrophy leading to vaginal dryness, dyspareunia, uh, which may be accompanied by mood and uh, sleep disturbances. Physical and psychological symptoms are often related. For example, night sweats may disturb sleep, leading to low mood or reduced ability to cope with vasomotor symptoms. Uh, belief about uh, menopause may affect also symptoms experience. Some may uh, have more uh, experience than the others. And negative expectations, beliefs, and low esteem are also associated with more problematic symptoms. So overall, if you see the menopausal symptoms, it consists of mood swings, sleep disorders, irritability, heart flushes, headaches, difficulty in concentration, loss of libido, and also the joint pain. So what are the common etiology of menopause? If we see the normal physiology is just a follicle exhaustion, what we have seen in that graph. And also it can be due to atrogenic surgery when you do a hysterectomy or oophorectomy along with it. Uh, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, premature menopause, 
due to certain lesions uh, and genetic autoimmune, obviously, idiopathic atrocity. So what are the key points you consider before treating on menopause? Uh, menopause is a normal event most of the time, but around 25% of women will have problematic parasomatous symptoms like hot sweats and night sweats, hot flushes and night sweats, which are the very common uh, symptoms. And that impair the quality of life and uh, might require treatment in these ladies. And systemic hormones replacement therapy is the mainstay. And this is also the most effective treatment for vasomotor symptoms. And may also improve the urogenital uh, symptoms also. But uh, for those wishing to avoid HRT particularly, there are non-pharmacological and non-hormonal pharmacological treatments are available for particularly for vasomotor symptoms. And uh, most non-hormonal treatment act quickly also. So if there is no improvement after two to four weeks, we can consider a different approach. And management of menopausal symptoms should be individualized. Uh, it cannot be generalized in all the females. Some may respond to some and some may not. And address patient aims and preferences for treatment. Like we, we have to consider the most important uh, symptom of the lady instead of treating the whole. And therapy should target the symptom that most affect function and quality of life of the lady. So what are the problems accompanying menopause? First and foremost is the vasomotor symptoms, but are hot flashes, uh, coronary heart disease, breast cancer, osteoporosis, urogenital atrophic symptoms like urinary urgency, dyspareunia, also the dementia. So if we consider individual risk factors, osteoporosis, risk factors of personal or family history of fragile fracture early, menopause, family history of um, osteoporosis, alcohol, tobacco, or caffeine intake in the lady, uh, dietary low calcium intakes, sedentary lifestyles, um, lack of physical activity, medication, particularly glucocorticoids more than three months, so what can be the preventive measures in these cases? First and foremost is the lifestyle changes. Doing a weight-bearing exercise helps a lot in osteoporosis, especially. Smoking, suggestion, uh, nutritional changes, uh, taking adequate calcium, vitamin D, medications, particularly bifosphonates, alendronate or evandronate monthly, and also the estrogen helps a lot in osteoporosis prevention. And what about the CSD, coronary heart disease? This is a leading cause of death in women. And risk for women much lower until menopause, but after which it rapidly approaches to that of men. So large body of animal in in vitro invitance shows beneficial effect of estrogen or cardiovascular death. A large number of carefully designed retrospective and observational study show that postmenopausal estrogen therapy results in 50% reduction in CHD related events. But main criticism here is a selection bias. Women taking hormones may have a healthier lifestyle than those who are not taking treatment. And what the WHI study says, Women Health Initiative study, whatever it was, uh, NIS-sponsored, long-term, multi-centered, and largest uh, study. Uh, designed to determine whether the HRT could prevent coronary heart disease. And in that key, uh, study, the major arms were, uh, major arms are 625 conjugated equinestrone and we, along with uh, 0.25 milligram of metroxyprogesterone acetate versus placebo. So the study was stopped after 5.3 years because of the excessive risk of breast carcinoma so the outcomes of the study was, if we see the CST, it is seven excess than placebo, 37 versus 30. Stroke has gone up, 29 versus 21. Uh, venous thromboembolism also very high, 34 in uh, comparison to placebo, 16. Race carcinoma, 38 in comparison to 30. Colon carcinoma and hip fracture has a better uh, score. It is 10 uh, uh, against 16 and 10 against 15. So what this study shows is completely 
uh, opposite or they just complete biological and in vitro data supporting beneficial effects. So nevertheless, WHI indicates that use of HRT in older women or uh, particularly women above 65 and for long periods of time, more than five years, increases the risk of breast cancer and coronary heart disease. So the dictum estrogen forever is no longer recommended now. So hormone replacement therapy, what are the contraindications then? Absolute contraindication is a breast carcinoma or endometrial cancer, current one, or a past history of breast or endometrial carcinoma. Undiagnosed vaginal bleeding, pregnancy, obviously it is not of use in HRT, acute and chronic liver disease, active venous thrombosis or thrombomolic disease, and relative contraindications are history of thrombosis or thromboembolism previously, and a strong family history of breast cancer. This is contraindication. So what are the options we have? The non-hormonal therapies we have is, for bisomotor symptoms, we have clonidine. This is alpha-2 blocker. Uh, selective serotonin reactive, uh, reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs, herbal estrogens, vitamin E, this can control vasomotor symptoms. Uh, coronary heart disease, we can use statins, aspirin. We can control hypertension and diabetes. Uh, particularly diet and exercise, smoking suggestion also will help a lot in coronary heart disease prevention. And osteoporosis, we have SERMs, selective estrogen receptor modulators, uh, biphosphonates, particularly elendronate and evandronate. Calcitonin also can be used and calcium, vitamin D, weight-bearing exercise, and smoking suggestion also. These help in osteoporosis. So the treatment of menopause, what are the issues we consider before starting any treatment? Is menopausal status, potential duration, how much she has to take, severity and impact of symptoms in that lady, whether lifestyle and likelihood of change, uh, smoking, whether diet, what kind of diet and exercise habits, other medical problems she has, or on ID medications, risk factor for coronary heart disease, whether already has a uh, known case of diabetes or hypertension or dyslipidemia, risk factor for breast cancer or family history, risk factor for osteoporosis, whether risk factor for deep vein thrombosis or uh, venous thromboembolism, likelihood of compliance and with medications, patient tolerance for risk, and obviously cost of treatment. So, HRT current situation, estrogen replacement therapy is safe and effective in most women for at least five years when begun at the time of menopause. But HRT should not be given to the women at increased risk of CSD or breast cancer or who has DBT and BT includes, uh, those includes uh, having age more than 60 years and risk of uh, coronary heart disease and breast cancer increases with the age and duration of HRT, particularly when it is more than five years. And uh, use of lowest effective uh, uh, lowest effective dose of HRT for the shortest necessary time should be used. So current situation is HRT should not be used with a clear indication or careful self-consideration. FDA approved indication like relief of vasomotor and vulvovaginal symptoms only and prevention of osteoporosis. And uh, whenever possible, non-oral routes of administration may be preferable to avoid even thrombosis. And benefits of HRT may also be achieved with non-hormonal therapy or non-pharmacological therapy also. So non-pharmacological treatments for vasomotor symptoms. Uh, what are these? So available options are CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy, particularly group CBT, uh, hypnosis, mindfulness and relaxation techniques, lifestyle changes, uh, particularly exercise, diet and supplements, yoga, and also weight loss. Uh, so complementary and alternative camps. So, CAM treatment for vasomotor symptoms, the most popular CAMs are herbal medicine, whatever nowadays so many uh, products are available in the market, uh, followed by soya or phytoestrogens, evening primrose oil also helps a lot, relaxation, yoga, 
acupuncture also helps a lot in treating these patients. Stellate ganglion block. This is injecting local anesthetic into sympathetic nerve fibers of the neck, that is stellate ganglion. Uh, this disturbs neural temperature regulation, but this is a very invasive and costly procedure and North American Menopausal Society guidelines states that more evidence is needed from ongoing trials before it can be available for uh, uh, as a treatment modality for vasomotor symptoms. So it is uh, at present not recommended. So what are the pharmacological uh, agents available for the, particularly for vasomotor symptoms, uh, SSRI and CNRIs. These are uh, very good drugs and have a very good uh, control over BMS particularly. So international guidelines and systemic reviews and randomized controlled trials recommend selected SSRI and SNRIs. SNRIs are uh, selective uh, serotonin and norepinephrine reactive uh, reuptake inhibitors. Uh, as a non-hormonal treatment for vasomotor symptoms. However, NICE recommend these are as a second line of treatment, not as a first line. Uh, so what are the therapies? Comparative efficacy, if we see uh, for different therapies available for VMS, non-hormonal. Uh, so non-pharmacological therapy, if we consider CBT or cognitive behavior therapy, group is better at least for eight hours and uh, for self-help uh, CBT it is one and a half hours there is reduction of problem almost approaching 50 percent reduction in case in comparison to control and there is improvement in mood sleep and quality of life and uh, hypnosis five hours therapy there is also reduction in frequency uh, of 74 percent almost and uh, severity score has gone up to 80 percent Yes, there is improvement in interference from hot pluses related mood and sleep, and also improvement in quality of life. And what are the pharmacological therapies available? Uh, SSRIs, particularly citalopram and citalopram, these are 10 to 20 milligram uh, per day. So here, if you see the uh, reduction in VMS frequency is almost 50 to 60 percent. There is decreased anxiety. There is no impact on libido, so improved quality of life. And when we consider paroxetine or fluoxetine also, it is also 50 to 60 percent improvement in VMS. And uh, regarding SNRI, venlafaxine, particularly desvenlafaxine, even is and all 75 100 milligram uh, per day. Uh, this is also acts very nice almost uh, 60 to 70 percent improvement in the symptoms there is improved sleep quality of life mood elevation and uh, only adverse effects are dry mouth GI upsets headaches these are uh, common side effects and uh, further if we are unable to control we can use gabapentin in divided doses from 300 to 900 milligram per day there is 40 percent improvement in uh, symptoms, uh, but still there is dizziness, drowsiness, increased appetite, weight gain. Regavalin acts better than gabapentin. And uh, so last, uh, clonidine, point one, in resistant cases where you can have 50% improvement in uh, symptoms, but still these are the same uh, side effects of dry mouth, tiredness, restless sleep can uh and can interact with antihypertensive also cause hypotension severe hypotension so what are the medical alternatives available people on clonidin ssri we have discussed already the and uh, replants and other vaginal biodesic moisturizer also available now clonidin enhances the effects of angelitis we know ssri improves 60 percent but we have seen in the chart uh, Gavapentin reduces frequency by 50% and severity by 50 but This we have already discussed. So this is the most important chart. Although it is not a mandatory uh, protocol for managing any uh, case of postmenopausal lady having vasomotor symptoms, but this is a, a generalized uh, guideline kind of thing where we can go for stepwise 
manner in managing uh, uh, menopausal symptoms. So after assessing, when when we are uh, starting a treatment, so we can go with a stepwise manner. For a, for every thing we introduce, we must wait two to four weeks to see the response before changing into another one. And in any point of time, we can in, we can uh, mix up two methods like non-pharmacological with pharmacological treatment for a, a better response. So non-pharmacological treatment we have we have discussed first is a CBT cognitive behavior therapy, particularly in growth. And then if uh, offer hypnosis if available locally, and then consider acupuncture if it is not helpful. If still ineffective, then go for a pharmacological treatment. And in pharmacological treatment, offer with the uh, SSRIs, citalopram, escitalopram first. If it doesn't, then switch over to SNRIs, particularly menlafaxine, uh, 75 milligram per day. And if it's still ineffective or not alter, not tolerated, then we go for a paroxetine, 20 milligram. And uh, uh, next step is if it is still you are not uh, able to achieve it, then go for a gaupentin 300 to 900 milligram per day in divided doses. Even if it is not achieved, then at last we can go for a clonidine point milligram per day. And in any point of time, we can start both together to get a better response. And regarding vaginal symptoms, we can consider for uh, silicon-based lubricants or water-based lubricants or consider topical anesthetic gels to uh, counter dyspareunia particularly. And uh, local estrogen can be applied after giving proper consent and uh, explaining everything regarding the risk uh, to the patient. So what plants uh, products that we have? So till now what we have discussed is all about the pharmacological and uh, behavioral therapies and all. But now we have certain plant products available, which is helping a lot. So plant use phytoestrogen as a part of their natural defense to control female fertility, to prevent overpopulation and overgrazing by herbivore animals. So these uh, products are used for, uh, particularly for menopausal symptoms. And these are uh, chemically, if we see, these are either phenolics and others. And in phenolics, we have isoflavonoids, flavonoids, stilbens, and lignans. Isoflavonoids, we have isoflavones. Many products are there now with isoflavones. Flavonoids are flavones, flavonones, and chalcones. There are stilbens and lignans. Others are torpenoids and saponins that we don't go in detail, actually. Uh, so isoflavones, what we know is the most common form in soybeans, lentils, and chickpeas. And uh, lignans found in bean sprouts, alpha alpha sprouts, and uh, uh, comestants are most cereals, fruits, and vegetables. Isoflavone effect on hot flushes is variable and inconsistent, and most only modest and delayed improvement of symptoms could be expected by another plant product that is black cohosh and also in the vitamin D, A, vitamin E, sorry. So hot flushes substitution soya nuts with the non-soya proteins. This dietary change and consume three to four times throughout the day is associated with a decrease in hot flushes and improvement in menopausal symptoms. Uh, and 25 gram of soya protein and 101 milligram of egg glycons isoflavones uh this also helps uh next uh, natural uh, herbs and remedies um phytoestrogens particularly red clover that is structurally similar to estradiol uh, efficacy data is insufficient till now black cohos this is also a buttercup family it controls flushes and other symptoms as claimed, but data still insufficient to date. Based on creams also, acupuncture, these are the remedies, natural remedies. But uh, today what we, right now what we discuss and what we are right now getting results 
are three products which are having a very good uh, promising results in particularly controlling in postmenopausal symptoms uh, these are uh, sanachem will 40 angelica gigas and uh, plomi sombrosa uh, sanachem uh, uh, will 40 this is uh, having a uh, active uh, ingredient in cinnamic acid and uh, in uh, plomi sombrosa it is esmethyl ester and Decursin and decursinal angelate in Angelica gigas. These uh, are having a very good results and it's my personal experience also people taking this are very happy. And we didn't have to switch over to either HRT or any other drug after using them in many of the patients. I am not saying about the all, but many of the patients have uh, are very good and satisfying results after using this and uh, one of the product we have right now what i am using is a estrogy 100 and that uh, after using twice a day patients are happy with the response and uh, i would say i don't know whether this this uh, plant products are available with any other product available in the market but what i came to who came through with this product I'm using, I'm happy with it. And people are also giving good response out of it. So thank you very much. This much I want to say for today. Mm, thank you and over to you. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for this uh, nice and uh, informative <coughs> presentation. So, meanwhile, I received a few questions. So, if you allow me, then uh, we can start on this. Yeah, yeah, we can discuss. Yes, yes. Sir. Yes. So, sir, the, the first question is as uh, hormonal treatment sometimes uh, causing some problems uh, associated with the uh, patient. So, what will be the exact uh, treatment approach for this? No, uh, yeah. The, so, my solution is that I, will, I would suggest that nowadays many products are available where we can avoid using uh, hormones, uh, particularly, uh, particularly systemic hormones. And uh, yes, we have seen people coming back earlier, we used to use directly estrogen or when particularly in surgically menopause cases, post hysterectomy suddenly patient have a severe symptoms. Uh, there, even if we use, we use it for a very short period because after that they come back with a lot of palpitation and other problems. So intolerance to uh, hormones are very common. So I would suggest you go for a non-hormonal and non-pharmacological management as first choice. Then if you are unable to control, then you go for this. And even with this, we can go for a behavior therapy, particularly cognitive CBT is very helpful. And once people start understanding that this is a normal behavior and normal procedure, which is normal physiology, which is happening inside me, the tolerance goes up gradually. And uh, the same symptom will reduce and she will be happy. So first try with the non-hormonal and non-pharmacological management first. And hormonal will be the last option you have. Then you will have minimal uh, side effects. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, another question is, uh, in case of early, break, uh, early menopause, uh, say around uh, 40, so sometimes it yeah. has been observed that uh, patients are really stressed and uh, so. So in that case, uh, how, what, is your, what will be your approach to uh, treat effectively? Neither. Those are the more, actually those who are having uh, natural menopause and late menopause, hardly they have symptoms. In my experience, what I have seen, uh, menopausal symptoms are highest in early menopause and surgical menopause cases, particularly those who are having undergoing hysterectomies. Uh, they have the maximum uh, uh, postmenopausal symptoms uh, like vasomotor and also the osteoporosis. So my opinion is you just give them first uh, try with a non-hormonal as it is what we have discussed now. And then you add phase wise, if it is not controlled, what the chart we have discussed, that is a very nice chart. There everything stepwise given. So you introduce and wait for a month to see whether you are getting your response or not. Along with that, always start with a behavior therapy. So if you consider both together and with a calcium, vitamin D, uh, regular supplement, particularly for early menopause, uh, I don't think you need uh, more and further uh, 
uh, problems in managing these centers. And uh, another question, sir. Ah. Just one question. Yes, sir. So, yeah, and uh, in case of, sir, uh, associated with menopause, uh, in case of some other urogenital problem, if it is other urogenital problem in, term, in terms of this menopause, then uh, uh, is that uh, non hormonal treatment is effective? Or that time to treat that particular issues you have to give for some hormonal treatment as well? And now, particularly you, particularly in urogenital uh, cases, it has been what uh, my experience is along with this non hormonal and non pharmacological uh, agents. If you use a uh, topical application of uh, estrogen, it gives a better result. Okay. Yeah, that uh, that is actually I have seen when you are using in a local application for estrogen, not as a systemic one. Along with this, I'm not saying uh, alone you are using. If you have a urogenital symptom along with menopausal symptom, just uh, start any non-hormonal or non pharmacological whatever plant product, whatever you have, your choice. And then add for a short span, uh, like twice a week. Now people are prescribing many places that twice or thrice a week application of local estrogen. That gives a wonderful result for them. Particularly sexual activity in a young uh, lady having a menopausal symptom. Obviously, dyspareunia is a big issue for them. So that we can use. Thank you, sir. So, sir, I could not find any other question. Okay. So, if you will allow me, then uh, we can uh, close sir, this we session. We will conclude because I have to go for another Foxy meeting locally here okay, at, at 6 p.m. Uh, so, that will be, I think, it is better if you conclude here. Yeah. Yes, sir. And uh, thank you very much, sir, uh, for your time yeah. uh, in uh, our platform and uh, for uh, such a nice discussion and uh, meaningful presentation. So overall, uh, it's a nice session with you. And uh, in future, also, we look forward to some uh, valuable session from you, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, sir, for your valuable time once again, sir. Good day, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.